So good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us for tonight's Dermatology Education Foundation webinar. This is a very special presentation that has been sponsored by a company that you may know called UCB. And I just wanted to take a few moments to introduce our speaker and of course our topic as well. Um, you may know that in October of last year, a drug called Bimzelix was approved, and we are very excited. It is our pleasure, of course, to introduce Dr. Brad Glick. Dr. Glick, if you were unaware, is a board-certified dermatologist and a derm surgeon. He is currently practicing in both Margate and Wellington, Florida, and it is our pleasure to introduce Dr. Glick for tonight's program. He is the promotional speaker for Bimzelix. Thank you again, everyone, for joining UCB's sponsored presentation. Thanks, Dr. Glick. Well, Stacey, as always, thank you so much, and, and thank you to DEF for having me here. And, and you can't be anything but excited uh, to have a, just another wonderful agent in our toolbox to help our patients with plaque psoriasis. So this is Bimzelic by Makizumab. I've been waiting for it a long time. It's finally arrived. Uh, clearly, you will see from the data I'm going to present this evening. Quickly and efficiently, I've got a lot of information to present that it is transformative and we'll see some amazing treatment responses. Uh, the indication is for the treatment of moderate to severe plaque psoriasis in adults who are candidates for systemic or phototherapy, a uh, very typical of our uh, patients and those individuals that have uh, plaque psoriasis. And the slides are not moving. Uh, I'm trying. <laughs> Someone could give me a hand here with the slides. They're not moving. And there we go. Let me just back up here. So as you know, this is a promotional program and, and I'm here on behalf of uh, UCD and very happy to be so. So let's dive in and talk about the impact, this global impact uh, that Benzelk has had. You know, we were waiting for this therapeutic for quite some time. And before launch, it was approved in 39 countries, uh, with now 40, including the United States of America, five uh, phase three clinical trials, over six years of clinical trial usage, approved for moderate severe plaque psoriasis by 11 regulatory authorities and in 40 countries, as I mentioned, uh, over 4,800 patient years of post-marketing exposure. And I think this is all really important, not only as we think about what the data is going to look like, as you're going to see in a minute, but also as it speaks to safety. Um, so with Bimzelix, uh, proven consistent to deliver rapid, complete, and sustained clearance uh, for more patients um, from their very first dose. And I think what you're going to see in a couple of moments uh, is that even just after one dose, we actually see dramatic uh, responses. I'm going to read a little bit of the package insert disclaimer. Um, themselves may increase the risk of suicidal ideation behavior. Uh, I will say globally that this very esteemed group that I'm speaking to this evening, we know that psoriasis has background comorbidities. Um, anxiety, a depression in the background, cardiovascular comorbidities. Remember, we know that this is a systemic disease. Patients going on themselves, like other biologic therapies, may be at risk of infections. We have to screen these patients for tuberculosis. We will screen them uh, by testing uh, liver function tests ahead of time, like we'll often do for these patients. And we'll also make the disclaimer that patients going on IL-17 blockers may run a greater risk of inflammatory bowel disease compared to those that are, that are not going on biologic therapies like IL-17 blockers, and will administer all live vaccines before putting patients uh, really on any immunomodulatory therapy. Now, with Bimcelix, what we offer our patients is really convenient dosing, um, rapid responses, complete clearance, um, maintenance up to three years, and a consistent safety profile. And we'll get to this dosing regimen in a couple of moments. And hopefully, now that the drug has been on the market for quite some time, uh, you've had an opportunity to use it. And I actually, in this past uh, several weeks, have had the opportunity to uh, utilize this therapy. And we will talk about uh, the Navigate Access and Patient Support Program. So let's jump in. 
uh, and talk about the data because we've been waiting such a long period of time for this drug to come into our toolbox. I've got a lot of information to present to you, multiple trials, four that we're gonna focus on here, and then actually a fifth, which is gonna give us three years of data that we can look at this evening. So let's start with Be Ready. So uh, this is the comparative trial between drug and placebo. Uh, the initial trial, we'll look at POSI 90 superiority. We're also going to look at head to head data versus astekinumab and adalidumab. So, our IL 1223 drugs and our anti TNF drugs. Uh, here is the data uh, versus uh, placebo in the control period. When we see 91% of subjects in the clinical trial, non responder imputation, the most stringent statistical analysis, 91%, 93% at clear or minimal disease, 91% uh, at uh, POSI 90 responses. If we go down to be vivid, very consistent responses 85% of the subjects at POSI 90 versus just half or 50% of those individuals in the use of Guinumab treatment group, clear and minimal disease. Remember, these are two great improvements from baseline, 53% use to Guinumab. And then we have these placebo responses at about 5%. What we're imparting here are these wide deltas, these dramatic responses between treatment group uh, and placebo. That's 360, 320 milligrams of Demzelix every four weeks for the first 16 weeks and then every eight weeks thereafter, which is the approved dosing regimen. We're gonna see in a couple of moments, treatment arms that were every four weeks in a continuum and every eight weeks um, after the 16 week control period. And here's the statistical comparison uh, between treatment group in Bimzelic versus adalidumab at the bottom and the b Shore trial, 47% of the subjects uh, in the adalidumab treatment group versus 86% uh, with Benzelix. And if we look at the superiority for uh, IgA responses of clear or minimal disease, again, all by non-responder imputation, we have one and a half times as many subjects in the Benzelix treatment group achieving this very high bar or clear or minimal disease. Very robust responses. And we're going to dig into some of this data uh, a, a little bit later in the talk. This is data from uh, the B-Radiant trial. And in B-Radiant, for the first time ever, what we looked at was a head-to-head -head comparison between uh, Bimzelix uh, by Mikijumab and Sikikinumab. We all know this as Cosentix. And what we did here is we raised the bar to two uh, arms of POSI 100 and, and clear um, by Investigators Global Assessment. It's really one of the first times that we've seen uh, not only this head-to-head -head comparison between 217 blockers, um, but also raising that bar for a primary endpoint compared to the other three trials we just looked at where we looked at POSI 90 and clear and minimal disease, we raised the bar to completely clear skin by both of these measurement tools. And so if we look at the superiority uh, versus uh, Sekikinumab, where Benzelic is concerned, again, standard dosing regimen. So these individuals receive two doses of 160 milligrams, totaling that 320 milligrams every four weeks with standard dosing uh, regimen for Sekikinumab with that five weeks of induction. We had 62% of the subjects achieving clear skin by POSI 100, 63% at clear by investigators global assessment versus 49% and 51%. And what I like to say here is very unique trial and we've really come a very long way. Let's put into perspective the significance of this therapeutic uh, that finally came to our toolbox just within this last couple of months. Over 2,200 patients across three phase three and one phase three B clinical trial. Now, one unique thing that I like to point out is that over 36, 36%, but over 30% um, of these subjects throughout these clinical trials were biologic experience. Typically, it's gonna be about 20 to 25% in most trials. And so there are a lot of challenges when you have a lot of biologic exposure, as we all know, uh, that when more of our patients will come into the clinic and they've been previously exposed to multiple biologics, they're challenging to treat. Among those 36%, 53% were previously exposed to anti-IL-17s. It shows that this is a newer generation clinical trial. Uh, over 40% were previously exposed to anti-TNF inhibitors, a, a smaller number of IL-1223 uh, at about 16%, and probably because that this is a much later trial. Many of these patients 
uh, that are recruited into these clinical trials are, are more of the modern day therapies like 17 blockers. And of course, many of our patients uh, still receive therapeutic exposure to TNFs like adalidumab, which we saw some of the data already, and then 14% uh, uh, IL-23. Uh, so this is the first and only approved biologic to selectively target the overly expressed IL-17A NF. This is an IL-17A NF inhibitor, reducing these two key inflammatory cytokines, which we know play a significant role uh, in this inflammatory burden that is experienced by our patients with plaque psoriasis. And so we know the inflammatory pathway in psoriasis is driven by both IL-17A and, and IL-17F. And we also know that there are innate and adaptive components uh, to the immune system that are responsible for the generation of uh, the plaques that we see in psoriasis. And so there are IL-23 independent uh, pathways by which we know that downstream uh, there are elevated levels uh, of IL-17 in patients with plaque psoriasis. And so we see IL-17A and IL-17F not only just coming specifically and directly from these inflammatory cytokines, but we know that IL-17 has other sources like gamma data cells, uh, innate lymphoid cells, as we see here too, and also just directly uh, from keratinocytes themselves. We know that IL-17A are key, uh, IL-17A and IL-17F are key drivers, uh, drivers of inflammation uh, in plaque psoriasis. And IL-17A and IL-17F about 50% homologous. And we know, we've learned that there are certain components of these uh, two dimers uh, where there are specific subsets uh, of these inflammatory cytokines that we'll talk about in a couple of moments that are key in our understanding of the inflammatory burden uh, of plaque psoriasis. Now, Bimzelic selectively targets a region, of IL-17A and IL-17F, that is common to both of these inflammatory cytokines. And if you see down at the bottom here, that IL-17A uh, and IL-17F dimers uh, provide more inflammatory burden, as I alluded to before. And what Bimcelix does is it binds not only to uh, IL-17 A and F, but specifically these dimers of AA, AF, and FF. Now, if we think of IL-17 A blockers, what we do know is that they specifically bind to these dimers AA and AF, but not IL-17 FF. And I think this is what makes this new generation of a therapeutic light beam Zelix so unique because I believe that we can say that this is a more highly targeted therapeutic because it blunts IL-17 uh, FF. And, and, I, and I think that this will speak to, as you'll see in a couple of moments, um, the robust uh, data that we'll uh, look at when we dig a little bit deeper uh, in some, into some of the trials. And so one of the unique things about Bimzelix uh, is its rapid response. We will see responses that are dramatic after just one dose. So let's dig into this data. Now, um, there's consistent results uh, in three phase three trials, as I alluded to before, one phase three B clinical trial. And what we see when we look at that mean improvement to the absolute POSI score, we have about an 80% reduction, mean improvement uh, of that absolute POSI score just after that first dose. And we'll dig into some of that data even a little bit more later on when we look at some of the specifics of the studies and the consistency of that 80% mean improvement of that absolute POSI score uh, at the end of four weeks after one dose consistently across all the trials. But let's look at these primary endpoints uh, demonstrated across the four clinical trials that I mentioned previously. Now, remember that the primary endpoint in B-radiant was POSI 100, but let's look across the board and look for consistency of response. And if you look at B-radiant, you look at B-ready, you look at B-vivid, and be sure, again, uh, head-to-head -head versus secukinumab, placebo control would be ready, head-to-head um, -head versus eustachinumab, and head-to-head and be sure which versus adalidumab. We have about four out of 10 achieving posi 90 just after week four. So that's one dose. So when we think of week four for secukinumab, just using as one example, that's four doses. Um, if we look at just four weeks, and we look at the placebo response, we have 45%. Again, this is not that 91% at week 16. This is 45% of the subjects versus none in placebo. 
uh, at POSI 90. And so dramatic responses and consistency across or for these clinical trials. Now, if we go back and we start to think about that 80% overall mean uh, improvement to the absolute POSI score uh, from baseline, and, and we look at the consistency of response, um, 80% uh, versus secukinumab, 72% uh, uh, with four doses uh, of secukinumab. Um, if we look at B-radiant, uh, versus 11% versus uh, placebo. We're talking again, mean improvement of POSI, uh, absolute POSI score from baseline, B vivid 83%, B sure 83%. We can just look at the consistency, as I was alluding to before, of this mean improvement of that absolute POSI score uh, from baseline. And as is typical when we look at mean improvement of POSI score, should one question the statistical analysis, it is the last observation uh, carried forward. In terms of complete clearance, we'll look at some week 16 data. Uh, again, consistent results across these uh, clinical trials, these four clinical trials that I'm presenting here this evening. About two thirds overall achieved complete clearance um, or POSI 100 in each one of these clinical trials. And here's the data right here. You look kind of from left to right and you look at those blue bars between 59 and 68% of the subjects across all four of these uh, clinical trials are able to achieve clear skin by POSI 100. You know, when I think of this, I really think we, we've come a very long way. We see these deltas between treatment group uh, in b radiant versus um, secukinumab, a Y delta of 67% in the Be Ready trial. So just compared to placebo, and again, these wide deltas in comparator trials between ustekinumab and also uh, adalivimab. Uh, POSI 90 data, just consistent result, results uh, across the clinical trials. And so we see this week 16 data here, four doses of Bimzelix versus seven doses of secukinumab. And we see these, uh, these differences between treatment group and placebo. Remember that the primary endpoint um, in the B-Radiant trial is that of POSI 100. This is just showing our POSI 90 dot data. Again, very consistent responses. If you can almost draw a line across the top of all of these studies, and we can say between 85 and 91% of the subjects in the Bimzilla treatment group, again, statistical analysis by non-responder imputation, between 85 and 91% of the subjects uh, achieved POSI 90. It's nice to see what happens in that four week period. Someone needs to get clear very quickly. Someone's getting married. They have significant plaque psoriasis. They get those, uh, the first couple of doses, the one dose of those two injections of Bimzelix, and they are, it's an 80% mean improvement, their absolute POSI score. It's quick. It's nice to see what happens at week 16 where we see these consistent differences between treatment groups and comparator group or those wide statistical deltas. Uh, between treatment group and placebo, but what happens at the end of one year? Do we sustain this clearance over time? If we look at the B-Radiant trial, 67% of patients achieved complete clearance up to one year. In the B-Sure trial, 70% of patients achieved uh, this very, very consistent response over one year of POSI 100, clear skin. We can tell our patients they've got about a 70% chance of being clear uh, after uh, a year, just remarkable data that we've really not seen before uh, with a therapeutic uh, biologic agent. Uh, we want to talk about rapid responses. Now, remember the B-Radiant trial, we're looking at the primary endpoint of POSI 100. If we look at rapid responses and complete clearance from the very, very first dose, again, NRI uh, uh, statistical analysis, and we look at just one dose, we have 14% of the subjects um, at POSI 100, and we go all the way out to week 16 with four doses of therapy, and we have over 60% of the subjects uh, at POSI 100 and over 80% and getting close to 90% of the subjects um, at POSI 90. Um, if we start to look out um, in the B-Radiant trial in terms of sustainability of this response over time, we look at week 16 and we look all the way out to week 48, uh, we have a consistency of response. You can draw a straight line all the way across with very, very limited dip in response. There's no sawtooth pattern, as I like to say. So patients that respond and they're responding in that control period, they continue to respond to over time and sustain clearance as we see here, maintained up to 48 weeks. 
what about being able to sustain that POSI 100 response? So here's one year data, just up to about one year. This is from the B Shore trial where we had a head to head comparison between Bimzelix and Adalidumab, that anti TNF inhibitor. And if you look all the way out to the right, whether the subjects were on weekly dosing, or they crossed over from uh, weekly dosing to every eight week dosing. Look at the consistency of response. We're in that 70% range of individuals uh, able to achieve and maintain that uh, POSI 100 response. Well, for a drug that took a while to come into our toolbox, one of the nice things about it is we can look at three years of data. So what about ha what happens at the end of three years? Well, in the B bright, bright trials, we'll look at in a couple of moments, that's a three-year open label extension. 82% of those subjects uh, that were POSI 100 responders uh, at week 16 were able to maintain such a response up to three years. And, and here's the study design, and it's pretty typical of what we would see uh, in a study design. The, every four-week treatment arm, we have our placebo crossover from that control period uh, up to week 16, and then we have our uh, every eight-week arm. And, and then when we get up to the um, open label extension at week 24, and then crossover occurred based on whether one was a POSI-90 responder or greater or less than POSI-90 responder. And then you can see that there were these randomizations into different arms at every four weeks and every eight weeks so that we can really determine uh, what the significance is of, of weekly dosing, continued weekly dosing, or crossover into every week, uh, every eight weeks. So what did we see in those POSI 100 responders uh, our way out to uh, 96 weeks as we see here? About 82% of those individuals who were at every eight week dosing uh, that cross over to um, uh, every eight weeks or just uh, eight every eight weeks throughout the study, uh, we see just a consistency and a maintenance uh, of response of POSI 100. We can say to our patients that out to three years, uh, they're able to uh, maintain a, a clear skin by POSI 100. And so from the data that I've been uh, presenting to you at week four, remember that 80% mean improvement uh, in the absolute POSI score. Two thirds of the subjects in the clinical trial uh, achieving POSI 100 by week 16. At the end of one year, about 70% uh, percent of the subjects or seven out of 10 achieving complete clearance after about one year. And again, with the BBI trial, as we just saw, about 82% of maintaining that complete clearance over time. What does that rapid and complete clearance look like? Well, you know, here we have some photographs of our patients from the clinical trial. So this is week zero, week four. Remember, that's just after one dose. Again, that's two 160 milligram uh, doses, either by syringe or auto injector, which is what's available, as we'll see in a couple of moments. Uh, four doses here at week 16, POSI 100 responses, and we see the rapid clearance at week four, and then really pretty much uh, uh, just post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation with complete clearance of the plaque, and then out to uh, one year of uh, uh, POSI 100 maintain, and that's every four-week dosing in this individual. Uh, here's an individual at baseline, pretty significant absolute POSI score at 38.7, a BSA of 76%, pretty widespread psoriasis. Um, or, already after just one dose at POSI 75, um, and then week 16 after four doses, already at clear skin, you see primarily post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and just uh, after 12 doses, uh, week 48, um, just complete clearance here. Too. Of course, of course, we like to see uh, pictures of the en entire patient, uh, but nevertheless, we see complete clearance uh, in these clinical photos. So I think it's pretty clear that this drug works quite well, but what about safety? Well, another nice thing about the ability to uh, have a drug that unfortunately took a long time to come to market in some respects, but nevertheless made it into our toolbox in this last couple of months, we have robust safety data as well too. So uh, 989 particular subjects in the 300 milligram every four week uh, dosing regimen, over 1700 in all doses, three double-blinded clinical trials, six double-blinded and two open-label trials with a total of over 4,200 uh, 4, uh, patient years. So a robust amount of safety data. Now, when it comes to incidences of adverse uh, events of interest, which we're often concerned about in terms of serious infections, inflammatory bowel disease, MACE, malignancies, 
uh, serious hypersensitivity reactions other than injection site reactions where we see 2.7% of individuals uh, uh, having some injection site reactions and a particularly low number. All of those other adverse events uh, of interest are rather low numbers that we see in a control period versus placebo. Uh, similarities in terms of um, um, malignancies, and these numbers fall below what we would expect in a large population of psoriasis patients. And similarly, when we look at the longer term extension data uh, with the phase two and phase three trials, uh, these are numbers that are rather acceptable uh, in terms of incidences of adverse events of interest with not a specific safety signal uh, that we see here in terms of safety. Um, because we're inhibiting IL-17A and F and IL-17 inhibitors in general, we may see some candida. And so in the short term uh, phase of this trial in the control period, uh, we, we did see in the phase three trials between week six, zero and week 16, um, a rate of candida about 9%, 7.6% uh, of oral candidiasis versus none in placebo. And the overall rate, when we look at all doses in the long-term trial, uh, the number is rather stable at, at about 11 11% and oral candidiasis about 10%. About 0.4% of those individuals that were treated with Mzelix uh, discontinued therapy. So it's a very small number. Uh, if patients do develop candidiasis, including oral candidiasis, this is a phenomenon that we're fairly used to treating. Uh, for, for instance, because we have patients on antibiotics all the time. And so one event was experienced uh, uh, by the majority of the subjects in the clinical trials in that first year of therapy. And oral candidiasis was treatable. There are several protocols that can be used that we would use in clinical practice. And the median treatment duration of antifungal therapies was about uh, 12 days for the clinical trials. Uh, there is a call out uh, for um, hepatic events, albeit they're small. The threshold is around 1%. It's 1.9%. I don't minimize that. But if you look in the placebo group, it's 1.2%. We do see hepatic events in large populations of psoriasis patients. And if we look at uh, uh, all doses to the right and the um, exposure uh, incidence rates, uh, we look at the per 100 patient year rate, it's about four. That means if we treated 100 patients in a year, there would be four events. And so it's it's a generally a, a very low number. And I think what the FDA is doing is, um, you know, they, they've created different thresholds uh, with some of the newer clinical trials for things like um, hepatic function. And so the recommendation is that we check liver functions at baseline and potentially, depending on the patient and any of their background history um, at other times uh, throughout their, their treatment periods. Uh, there is no box warning for this therapy, but there is a, a call out for suicidal ideation and behavior during the clinical trials. So there were the control periods, some higher rates of suicidal ideation. One completed suicide in a long-term extension study. Uh, no causal association has been noted between Bimzelix and the risk of suicidal ideation and behavior and the overall rate of SIB or suicidal ideation behavior across the psoriasis clinical trials was about 0.13 per 100 patient years. Um, so a, a very low number. And if we look out to the right in terms of the long-term extension data, um, about 0.1 per 100 patient year, again, a low number. We counsel our patients who have psoriatic disease in general. We let them know that there's a greater risk of anxiety and depression and even um, suicidal ideation and behavior in general. And so I think we have to take this into consideration before prescribing uh, Bimzelix so for our patients, as we do with really all systemic therapies, particularly biologics for our patients with psoriasis. Uh, this is an IL-17 ANF antagonist that's uh, indicated for the treatment of moderate to severe plaque psoriasis in adults who are candidates for systemic or phototherapy. We've gone over the SIB uh, information previously. Any patient going on a biologic therapy needs to be counseled regarding the risk of infection, and we screen these patients for tuberculosis before placing them on any immunosuppressive therapy, uh, including uh, biologics like Benzelix. Um, screening at baseline uh, for um, uh, hepatic changes, so liver functions are test, uh, checked, uh, like with all uh, IL-17 blockers, including Vimzelix. We're going to counsel our patients regarding the potential risk for inflammatory bowel disease, but as we saw in those adverse events of interest, the numbers were low. Live vaccines are administered uh, before any immunosuppressive therapy, and the most common adverse reactions at about 1% or greater were URI, 
oral candidiasis, headaches, injection site reactions, centinia infections, those particular consequences that we might see when we inhibit uh, IL-17A. There is convenient dosing with this drug. Uh, it's one dose every four weeks for 16 weeks, and then one dose every eight weeks thereafter. And remember, that's two 160 milligram either pre-filled syringe or an auto-injector. And then it's great to see that the drug is highly effective, perhaps one of the most effective therapies that we've seen in our toolbox for psoriasis. But if you can't get it, that's not a good thing. We see a very nice safety profile with Benzelix, as I've just gone over. But there is rapid access with this drug. And I can tell you, I have a number of patients on therapy already, and it was actually quite seamless getting the drug. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this Navigate program, and your representatives from the company can talk uh, to your uh, to you about this. Um, we can get the drug for as low as about $5 per dose and uh, $15 per dose while the eligibility is being determined. The company uh, thus far has been re really forthcoming with samples. There's a single point of contact. They help with the prior authorizations. And this My Navigate portal that actually Stacy mentioned at the beginning um, is quite helpful with uh, working uh, with the uh, payers in terms of saving cards and what have you. So Bimzelic is the first and only approved biologic to selectively target uh, both IL-17 A and F. And as we went over, rapid response, complete clearance, maintenance up to three years. Very nice to have that kind of data when a drug just comes into our toolbox, a consistent safety profile, and certainly a convenient dosing, as I just went over. So with that and a bunch of slides, uh, I'm finished, uh, and um, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Glick. That was amazing and a tremendous amount of very new information for everyone to go over. I would say as well that if anyone does have any questions, ultimately you can type that into the Q&A or the chat, please do. As a follow-up at the conclusion of this program as well, if you're thinking tonight about some additional questions that you all have, please do feel free to submit them to info at dermnppa.org. Or of course, you can always reach out to your specific UCB local representative or medical science liaison as well. Thank you again, Dr. Glick, for all of your time uh, this evening. And a special thank you as well to UCB Incorporated for sponsoring tonight's program. It was a pleasure to have you on.